Welcome to Retro Crisis, and on today's video I'm going to try something a little bit different. So I'll be discussing my unscripted thoughts about my experience at the Power Up event at the London Science Museum. So for anyone wondering, what is the Power Up event? Here is the website, and this is the language used on the website to describe the event. So it says, 160 consoles, 5 decades, game on. This hands-on, fully interactive gaming event features the very best video games and consoles from the past five decades. From Pong to Pac-Man and Minecraft to Mario, there's something for everyone. Whether you're a retro games fan, a serious gamer, or just want to beat your family at Mario Kart. Play against friends in multiplayer showdowns, rediscover your childhood favourites, and test out some of the latest virtual reality experiences at this ultimate gaming extravaganza. And then it's got a link to the floor plan and it says will you make it onto our leaderboards so this is new so it looks like they've extended the dates for the event so it clearly must be popular tickets cost about eight pounds make sure you book online before attending the event and also you'll be required to book a ticket to get into the museum but i believe the museum entry is free anyway so on screen i've put up a map of the floor plan of the power up event so the event is actually based in the basement of the science museum it's uh, dark it's dimly lit kind of like uh, the arcades of our youth the only things missing are the, the neon lights and the sticky floors. So the sections primarily comprise of retro systems, modern systems like the uh, PS4, PS5, Xbox One X, Xbox One, uh, and uh, Nintendo Switch stuff. Uh, you also have PCs, uh, arcade machines. You have a physical section, which uh, involves games that require those kind of special controllers. You also have themed sections like Zelda, superheroes, Sonic, Mario, uh, Disney, Lego, sports that kind of stuff and then you also have a giant halo section in this area here you can see there's a food counter uh, just be careful the food is quite expensive i think uh, cans of soft drink were like over two pounds so you might want to get your lunch before you attend the event otherwise uh, prepare to pay above the odds so who is the target audience for power up the actual event was full of loads of children and teenagers and I think it was mostly down to the fact that it was the Easter weekend and uh, all the schools are closed so you know parents are going to want to take their kids out to have some fun. It was nice to see the children like absolutely glued to the screens you know they were mesmerized by all the games there and it was nice to see the parents also having a good time. I mean I lost track of the number of times I heard parents say oh I had that game when I was your age or you know kind of fawning over games they would have played as kids or you know just seeing the systems for the first time in many years it was heartwarming it was nice and I am glad to say that the crowd at the event were very polite and uh, very civil everybody was very courteous and uh, didn't hog any system there was always a system free to play, so you would never have uh, been waiting around for too long to get a turn on a system. I was very grateful to get a chance to play on a Jaguar 64 and uh, an Amiga CD32. A really cool area at the uh, venue was this timeline area at the back. Uh, basically, it was a, a row of tables, and on the tables you had one of each retro gaming system just kind of sat side by side in chronological order and it formed a kind of a timeline of systems. I felt like this was the most educational part of the event. Above each system there was a small placard which uh, kind of had some fun facts about each system. So as you moved on to each system in chronological order you got to read a little fact about the system, you got to use the controller, you got to actually play a game on each system too. It was a nice bit of time traveling, it was a lot of fun, I, I enjoyed that a lot. So while my uh, slot was about two hours, I was kind of done within an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half. I think I'd got my fill at the event uh, due to various reasons. Firstly, I think it was down to the selection of games there. It was truly a smorgasbord of D-list titles. It just felt like somebody had gone onto eBay, searched for retro games and then sorted the list by cheapest to expensive and then just picked like the first 50 cheapest games that they could find. It was uh, kind of really lame games like Paperboy and World Cup Italia 90. It would have been nice if there were some rarer titles there, maybe like Mr. Gimmick or Little Samson. You know, games that a regular Joe would just never have the opportunity to purchase or even play. The list of games available to play, they were just easy to obtain. There's nothing special. I mean, anyone can get their hands on Mario Kart or Star Wing or even Ocarina of Time. I think that Breath of the Wild there as well, which is 
a very popular title. I mean, these are all good games, but they're not difficult to find. You could have these experiences at home yourself. It would have also been nice to see some imported games that just never made it to our shores. I'd say overall the game selection was very low effort. It just felt very last minute. Another thing I was disappointed in was the uh, selection of systems there. I mean, credit to the uh, organizers, they got all the big systems there, all the famous systems, but there were some notable omissions like uh, add-on systems like the 32X, the Sega Mega CD, and even um, imported systems like the Famicom Disk System or the SG-1000 or the DD64. They would have been really cool to have uh, been present. I mean, those systems have some pretty good games. That shouldn't be for Gotten like a Sonic CD, Final Fight CD, Snatcher, uh, the Famicom Disk System had some cool games. It would have been great if they had Doki Doki Panic on uh, display. I think that title alone would have blown some minds and people would have been like, wait a minute, this looks just like Super Mario Bros. 2. Not realizing that Doki Doki Panic was the, uh, the game that Mario Bros. 2 was built upon. I think games like that, which are hard to obtain, would have uh, made the experience a bit more valuable, I think. The arcade area was another area that I was just really disappointed with. I mean, all the arcade machines there were these kind of modern aftermarket systems. What frustrates me is, you know, sticking an LCD panel onto a bit of wood that's shaped like an arcade machine doesn't make something an arcade machine. They should have had at least one coin-operated arcade machine from back in the day. There's something about playing a retro game on a CRT screen which just adds this undescribable level of magic to a gaming experience and sadly this uh, venue considering how many retro systems were available there was not a single cathode ray tube tv screen on display anywhere i think the only crt they had there was like um, a vectrex i mean the vectrex looked great it's just something about the CRT just made the image really crisp and smooth and just they just felt like there was this depth and richness in the image. And that's me talking about a Vectrix, which is a black and white screen with vector-based graphics. <laughs> developers of these retro games made those retro games with CRTs in mind. You know, the developers took advantage of all the flaws of the CRT screens and, uh, you know, the, the lack of standardization. You know, it all added to the magic of playing these retro games. When playing retro games on the, the little dinky flat panels they had there, it just makes the image look hideous and you lose something when you're not playing on a CRT. So the handheld section was also something I was a little bit disappointed in because the handhelds were actually spread throughout the event on these little small tables and, and because the venue was so dark you could walk past one of these tables and totally not see a console on the table. It would have been great if all the handhelds were like in one concentrated area which was you know clearly labelled handhelds and that way if you go to the venue, you know, you, you wouldn't miss any of them. You'd see them all and, you know, you can plan your time accordingly to try each one of the systems. They had a Game Boy and a Game Boy Advance there, which was near on rendered redundant because those screens were never backlit. And because the venue was so dark, you could barely see what was on the screen. And there was no way of turning the brightness up on the screen because there was no backlight on those screens. It would have been great to take advantage of those backlit modded Game Boys that people um, put on Instagram and YouTube all the time. Fortunately, the systems like the PSP and the DS didn't suffer this because, you know, they had backlit screens and it was a lot easier to, to, to play those in the dark. I think my favourite section was the section labelled physical and this area had games that required speciality controllers. So you had games like the, uh, the Donkey Kong game on the GameCube which required the bongo drums, I forget what it's called. You also had that uh, fishing game on the Sega Saturn that had that fishing rod controller. You had Guitar Hero and people playing Wii Sports. I thought this area was the coolest because it came closest to providing experiences that are not readily available at home and not, you know, particularly easy to emulate on a PC, for example. You know, con using controllers that require more than a D-pad or an analog stick is, is always fun. Hopefully next year they will consider making this area uh, larger and expand on it with more games that require uh, speciality controllers. I fully respect and appreciate that I'm probably not the target audience for uh, the Power Up event. You know, I've been so far 
down the rabbit hole of retro gaming for 20 plus years, you know, not much surprises me anymore. You know, I, I fully accept that the selection of games there isn't for me. So I cannot recommend Power Up to kind of retro gaming nerds. However, I can absolutely fully recommend the event for casual gamers, or maybe even just gamers that are, you know, dipping their toe in the whole retro gaming scene. If you're a parent and you have children that are off for the Easter break, you cannot go wrong. They will have a lot of fun and you may even find yourself having some fun. There are many um, systems here that have four player setups. So I think the Dreamcast, the N64, the GameCube, uh, and I think they even had a Mega Drive with Micro Machines, or, you know, using one of the old J-Carts. Going here with your friends and family and playing against each other on the four player setups is a lot of fun. And for that reason alone, definitely check out the power up of them. But as I said, for retro gaming nerds, you might feel a bit shortchanged here. However, if you are, say, a parent that's being dragged to this event by your children and you have no interest in games whatsoever, remember, this event is hosted at the London Science Museum and the Science Museum itself is a walk through time and space. It's magnificent. It's one of the best museums in London. It's truly not to be missed. Anyway, I hope this video was useful and I hope my ramblings were reasonably coherent. This has been Retro Crisis. Thank you for watching.